absolutely uh, the number one. Uh, that's probably the biggest impact we can do. So that's one example where these silos really need to come together if we're going to take this further forward. John uh, got together about 40 people to come up with the challenges document. Levels of inflammatory proteins like TNF being really high that we would treat with medication. There was one well done study in Europe where they didn't just ask patients because it's difficult to say when you're stressed and when you're not, especially in hindsight. So there's solid biologic evidence that stress can uh, sort of get you closer to the threshold. I have become completely convinced that patients say they feel well and have no memory of what it's like to really feel well. I have Hear that over and over. become much more uh, aggressive in regularly looking at my patients in some way. As much as I hate to put you through a prep and, and hate doing it, um, I find that nothing is more helpful to me at this moment in time than doing a scope and seeing how things look. And I'm shocked that I see some patients in the office that say they feel great and we look inside and their bowel looks awful. And we see the other extreme as well. So we're starting to understand that if we simply ask people how they feel, that may not be good enough, that we need to look and figure out if things are truly healed. On the research side, I'm interested in, in the mucosal surface. So that's uh, what has been, for most of us who are living healthy lives, it's a good neighborhood, but it's, it's a bad neighborhood. It's a, it's a neighborhood with troubles when you have IBD. And so using genetics, microbial analysis and the like, I like to understand what makes it a bad neighborhood and what can we do to make it a good neighborhood, that's what I think the cure will be like. I think in a subgroup of patients, we are very good at inducing remission. The challenge that we all have here is figuring out the differences between those patients that were effective and patients that yeah, were Yeah, and in my view, there, there are all kinds of remission. There's a clinical remission, I feel good. That's probably the easiest benchmark. Then there's the endoscopic remission, mucosal healing, no, no further ulcers. But if you take a biopsy, even if you don't see ulcers, you a lot of times see inflammation. Finally, from the mechanistic standpoint, then there's biochemical remission. And that's really, in my view, that's where you get a true sustained clinical remission. That the, the disease incidence in kids has gone up twofold the last 10 years. It's, uh, it's maybe 20-fold uh, since World War II in in urban Western lifestyle. I like to know what that's about because if, if there's a 20-fold increase in disease burden because of something about the environment that we're living in, then we can understand what that is. Turn it back, we get rid of 95% of the disease. So we know that the genes increase the risk of inflammatory bowel disease, but some people who carry the genes go on to develop Crohn's disease. Some people who carry those develop other autoimmune diseases, not inflammatory bowel disease and others remain perfectly well. So why is that difference there? What is the gene-environment interaction? We're going to talk about stress. We're going to talk about toxicity of medications, not only single agents, yeah. but the combination therapy. Uh, many people brought up diet, alternative therapies, and then I'm going to pose the question of what's the most important advance recently in diagnosis and treatment. So. Stress. Is stress a cause of the disease process and the manifestations? Uh, is it the effect, secondary effect of medications uh, or the disease process? Or is it a totally uh, uh, independent variable? To start out this uh, biologically, the Intestine is the most richly innervated uh, tissue in the body. So there's a huge amount of neural connections between the brain and the intestine. And the information goes in both directions. And uh, you, can even, you can study in mice that if you cause certain sorts of stress responses, uh, your perceptual stress responses, there's neural firing down in the intestine which changes intestinal permeability and elicits local production of inflammatory molecules. 
So there's solid biologic evidence that stress can uh, sort of get you closer to the threshold of intestinal trouble. And uh, so I think that that's one rationale for intervening in that in two ways. One of them is you could take a pharmacologic approach and say, consider blocking molecules that those nerves are, n nerve cells are making, like substance P, neurotensin, and the like, to manipulate those in order to block that stress input. The other part is you can uh, do cognitive or other sorts of therapy uh, to help people with their cope with uh, dealing with uh, the stress of chronic illness or just the stress of living in, you know, 2010, so that, um, so that in either way you're interrupting that input, that physiologic input of stress into the health of the mucosa. There's so, lots of data, obviously, in animals, but yeah. what about in humans? So, so, all right, so bring us to humans. All right, so there are a couple of things here. Uh, the number one, why is this so hard for us to figure out? It seems like an easy enough question. And the difficulty is understanding even how to define stress. There have been a number of epidemiologic studies where they've asked patients if their levels of stress seem to correlate with their disease activity. And some say yes and some say no. There was one well-done study in Europe where they didn't just ask patients because it's difficult to say when you're stressed and when you're not, especially in hindsight but they looked at terrible life events that happened to patients, meaning death of loved ones, loss of children, terrible things, and see if that correlated with hospital admissions and increase in their disease activity, and there didn't seem to be a connection. With that said, these are hard studies to do, and I don't know that I believe that. One of my most favorite studies, and I tried to look up before the name so we can bring it up, was done um, with people where they randomized them to low stress situations and high stress situations. So they took a group of people, put half of them in a room, uh, gave them a New York Times, gave them time to uh, read and hang out and put on whatever music they wanted and then measured their inflammatory levels before and after. And then they took another group of people uh, and they put headphones on them and played, I think, country music in one ear and <laughs> classical music in the other ear and then gave them an IQ test that typically takes about an hour to do and they only gave them something like 30 minutes to complete it. Uh, and then they tested their inflammatory, some subtle inflammatory changes before and after. And lo and behold, this stressed out group actually had some subtle changes. Are these were IBD patients? I, I can't, that's what I was trying to look up. I can't remember if they were IBD patients. I think they were just people in general. Found that there were some subtle changes in the way their body responded to these situations, which isn't so hard to believe that you're, you, you feel your body responding differently. So I think there's no question that... Gastric stress, you know, acid production. That's right. So. There's no question that bo your body changes when you're right. stressed. But does it lead to flares of IBD? I, I think it potentially could, although we haven't proven that yet. I, I, it certainly leads Audience to people feeling worse. Yes or no? Yeah. 